it's not that you're copying other people's ideas, but you're you're looking at other people's company and being like, you know, I can either do it a different way or maybe better or or change it a little bit. And so, have I been stealing your vendor's ideas? I'm gonna introduce the person that you're all here to see, Craig Conover of Bravo's Southern Charm. Let's bring him up. Hey everyone, <laughs> thanks for having me, this is great. I think what our goal is, is trying to make people feel a little more comfortable in their skin, a little less guilty for focusing on a side hustle or something that their friends and family might not understand, um, and trying to give back to the creative world again. You know, we. I know we'll talk about it, but home ec and tech ed had a lot of in influence on my life, and a lot of those classes are are not in schools anymore. So we're trying to, you know, give sewing machines to different programs when we can, and uh, we generally just want to make people happier. And however we can do that, and in, in our unique way, we try. Absolutely, and, and there's so many different ways to be able to do that. And fortunately, you've had an incredible platform to be able to help and to be able to you know, put your time towards things, you know, building businesses, but giving back to communities. And how you started your business is something that everyone should take something out of. Um, and I want to talk about that because, you know, we'll get into Southern Charm, but where Sewing Down South came from and how you started. Let's go into that. Yeah, so I grew up, so in seventh grade, we had home ec where we learned to cook for half the year and learned to sew for the other half. And I kind of found this love for creating. Um, it was an outlet for my like OCD and like some, I was a weird kid kind of, but I added some quirks, but you know, I also played sports three times, you know, three seasons a year. And, but I really loved that, some of that traditional home stuff. And so I would go home. My mom was a school teacher, so she loved if I cooked cause it, then she didn't have to after school. And I really focused on gardening and cooking when I was younger and then I was going through a breakup like six or seven years ago, and when I left the house and left my garden and workshop behind, all I had was my sewing machine. And I thought I would make clothes, but I had never been taught how to make clothes, and it was really difficult to make clothes, and I, I remembered how to make a pillow. And so I tore up an old shirt and sewed it into a pillow, and when I turned it right side out, I just got this kind of, this thrill, this high. and. I posted a picture of some of the pillows that I had made on Instagram without making it too obvious, and the response was great. And I was like, you know, this might just be unique enough to work. And so that ended up with me putting all my effort into sewing, but not knowing how to turn that into a business. And so I had a room full of pillows and an inbox full of messages trying to buy them from me, but I just could not get out of my own way. And that's when my partners came into the picture. So Jerry, who's here, he, we went to college Jerry, together. Jerry, you can raise your hand, yeah. we'll give you some credit. He's my babysitter, but, uh, <laughs> and my better half, uh, and agent. But him and uh, his sister-in-law came into the picture and they were like, look, Craig, I think you have something here, um, but we wanna split the business with you. And you know, you're always told not to give up your company, but in this case, my dad was like, do you want all of nothing, basically, or a good piece of something that might really work? And so we, we split the company in three ways, and all of a sudden we had a real business. And that's kind of when the fun challenges started. But, you know, I tell people no one thought it was a good idea. And that's what you have to remember because a lot you of people. You saw it on the show. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, there was people telling you that you're crazy, don't do it. Yeah, and so I think a lot of people, I mean, COVID helped a lot with this, but a lot of people started to spend time on their side hustle and felt a little less guilty doing that. But some people might think like, well, if it was a good idea, someone else would have already done it, which is something that I thought. Or like, maybe this isn't a great idea because I'm the only one who thinks it's a good idea. So fortunately, I had my parents to support me emotionally, but I mean, they didn't know where I came from anyway. You know, they didn't expect their kid to end up on a reality show after law school and now start a sewing company. Um, but you know, if no one else thinks it's a good idea, it might actually be a really good idea. So don't keep that, you know, don't let that stop you. And the other part is when you're starting a business, you know, there's a lot of investment, not only time, but money. Um, how did you get to that point where all of a sudden, you know, you guys are manufacturing a lot of pillows and you have stock and that doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, so that was something, some wisdom that our partner uh, brought to the table. I was fortunate enough that I could, 
put time into sewing and starting this company with the security of the show. You know, I still had my income from the show, so it wasn't as risky, but I was leaving law behind for it. I thought that we would have to put in money or raise money to start the company, but actually we didn't at all. We only put in $1,000 each uh, because you kind of have to paperwork wise. But what we did was we, would, we didn't carry inventory in the beginning. So we would actually sell a pillow before it was even made. So we would charge the customer and then order it from our manufacturer. And at that time, we didn't have to pay the manufacturer for 60 days after we ordered it. So by the time we would even receive the pillow from them and send it to the customer, we would have already had their money. And so we get a lot of questions like, I don't have a lot of seed money or how can I start my business? But with tricks like that, which I would have never known, like I didn't know what net 60 meant without bringing in a partner, um, you know, there's a way to do it. And especially now with AI, like I know AI is confusing, but I have started to use it a lot. Some of my mentors told me, you know, if you haven't asked like chat GBT or whatever it's called to write you a marketing plan, then you're kind of, you're, you're missing out. And so like I asked an app on my phone to write us a marketing plan and it's the exact same plan that we have like teams doing, which is kind of crazy. Point of that being is like with tech these days, and with Shopify and all of these websites you can use, it's worth giving it a shot. Absolutely. And when you're building a brand, you know, it's evolution of product as well. Because doing the same thing over and over, people want new. And also being able to keep customers, to keep purchasing. Where do you find your inspiration for these different designs? <laughs> yeah, so my inspiration came from my travels and where I grew up from, which is, has always been on the coast. So very similar to an area like this, I grew up on the Eastern Shore of Delaware and then moved to Charleston for undergrad and law school, but I've never lived away from the coast. And so for those first two years of the company, everything was, you know, what you would see in areas like this. You know, people that have beach homes or live on the coast really like to decorate with that style. Um, and now, you know, we have people from the middle of the country and lakes and stuff be like, well, we love your pillows, but we want something too. But I mean, scaling the company has been, you know, the challenge. And, you know, I think I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but our first big success was after Hurricane Dorian, um, which hit uh, the Abacos in the Bahamas, which I was living down there at the time. Basically, when this company was starting, I had moved to the Bahamas to kind of find myself. And that's where a lot of the original designs came from. And so when Hurricane Dorian hit, I just put up an Instagram story and I was like, hey, all proceeds from our Bahamian pillow will go to the Bahamas. And that night we just, you know, on my phone, when we get an order, it makes a cash register noise, like the app Shopify, that's what it makes. And so I was eating with my parents and my phone kept going off. My dad was like, well, what's that noise? And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, I'll turn it on silent. That means we just sold a pillow. And he was like, no, leave it on. And so that night with everyone wanting to support the Bahamas, and me giving him a reason or an excuse to buy an extra pillow for their couch because they were helping out a good cause. We just sat there eating dinner and listening to the cash register sound go off and off and off. And all of a sudden, you know, Jerry called me the next day and was like, how do you expect us to make all these pillows, you know, <laughs> in time? And so we ran into the first time where not carrying inventory really hurt us. And I was upset because I was like, look, because of the show, if it takes people six weeks to get a pillow, they're going to order a pillow, not get it for an entire month and be like, of course, we tried to support Craig. He didn't follow through and we never got our pillow. And so fortunately, we switched to investing in, into inventory because it does cost money. You know, you need somewhere to store it um, and you're, you know, you're buying it before people buy it. But it was me showing them that they could have confidence in this business. And so then we started to carry inventory and we were able to grow a little bit more. Absolutely. And we're starting to see the product evolve even more. I mean, obviously, you know, with Paige and New York and different colors and having more of the modern element and the blacks and the whites, you know, you're going into or away from coastal yeah. and expanding that. Yeah. I mean, my um, girlfriend from the, for those of you who don't know, she lives in New York and our entire apartment's white and black. And so she wanted to support the company, but there wasn't anything that we carried that would really fit into her apartment, her aesthetic. So we did a line together, um, which did really well last year. And our the page collection, like 2.0, will come out in two weeks. 
that really fits, you know, some of that aesthetic that we're missing. And so it's entirely white and black and it's cool. It's got some, some neat patterns on it and monochromatic and, um, you know, but again, that was from me spending more time in New York, somewhere that I had never spent time and I had never decorated with black and whites before. And so it's really just keeping your eyes open. You know, we went, we traveled with her family to Europe this year and I spent a lot of time taking pictures of their aesthetic and their decoration. And, you know, we're doing a lot with lemons now and that came directly from Italy and how they decorate and going to trade shows like this. And so... It's fun, but it's it's kind of not overthinking it and just keeping your eyes open and and trusting your gut. And we were walking around the show earlier. You just remodeled your entire home. You know, talking about you're creating that more modern, traditional style home and different things that you're seeing. What type of projects have been, I guess, more fun for you as far as going through the process, just designing your own home? Yeah. I mean, that was a big thing. A big source of inspiration for me is my house in Charleston was built in 1975. And I just, I'm more of a modern person than I am like traditional. But my parents' style is like modern farmhouse, which is really cool. But in Charleston, we just don't have that. So I was able to use a lot of, you know, products that we designed, like our throw pillows to refresh the room, whether it be a new throw, you know, a new throw blanket on the couch or a new pillow, it makes your house look a little more new uh, without having to replace all of your furniture. And then I've always been a huge fan of candles and a simple candle being lit on the coffee table at night always made me feel a little more cozy, a little more at home. So after we were able to make the pillows successful, I was allowed by our branding partner, Amanda, to go into candles. And so making our candle line, I really enjoyed. It was a passion project during COVID. And um, we now make all of our candles in Charleston and we have, a hand, we have a hand on the process and it's been really fun. You know, we've gone into soft kitchen goods where, you know, I love to bake and I love to cook and now we have oven mitts and oven aprons and I think, or cooking aprons. And I think every time I see someone with a Sewing Down South product in another room of their house, I, you know, I just... I get butterflies and a little glimmer of happiness. It's a lifestyle brand. Yes. I mean, you're really covering, getting into all components of the home. We were talking about patio, yep. you know, expanding your living space. Um, how many people are investing in outdoor spaces, outdoor kitchens, pergolas, yeah. furniture, pillows? You know, let's talk about... Well, and yeah. we saw that a lot during COVID, right? You know, a lot of people... We're like, why not make our house somewhere that we feel like we're on vacation or a little cozy corner, a little patio outside. And I think people started to appreciate their, I mean, everyone likes their time at home, but they didn't necessarily had to travel to get that comfort anymore. And so we went into outdoor living. And so we've got a whole line of outdoor pillows now. You know, they're completely weatherproof. They compete with um, Sombrella. And, you know, we made a lot of the outdoor pillows you would find at Lowe's or Home Depot. They just... They were okay, but they weren't great. And I think we added some fun to it. So now we want to get into outdoor furniture. But, you know, it's hard for me to come up with new products without, you know, coming to expos like this and seeing. It's not that you're copying other people's ideas, but you're you're looking at other people's company and being like, you know, I can either do it a different way or maybe better or or change it a little bit. And so have I been stealing your vendor's ideas? I'm not going to admit to that. But no, I mean, it's... <laughs> It's great. It's great for inspiration. And it gives you, it shows you what works. You know, yes. people are selling it. There's a demand. Um, and, you know, through the conversation, we're talking about all different levels of inspiration from places you travel, people that you are with day to day. Um, is there, whether a mentor, a celebrity, somebody in particular that you look up to in the sense of business or where you want to go in your life? I mean, my goal has always been to be the male Martha store. Like, I think what she did was great. And I, you know, I wanted to have like a store like William Sonoma and be able to make my own, you know, cooking appliances, stuff like that. But I mean, she's done such a great job. And I mean, her friendship with, you know, Snoop Dogg makes me laugh all the time. Like she just... Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, she made, you know, she, she makes keeping like a good home cool. Right. Um, and she does great books on how to like, like you can, you know, I don't know how to fold a fitted sheet or I didn't until I Googled how to fold a fitted sheet and Martha Stewart has a video online showing you how to do it. And so I, I have looked up to her. I've never gotten to meet her and I don't think she knows who I am, but hopefully one day I'll be able to. Um, and uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about people like Ryan Reynolds and he has started to take equity stakes and, you know, instead of, you know, 
upfront payments and all the businesses that he's getting into. And I think that's been really cool. You know, he was able to buy a soccer team and, and increase its value 10 X within a year. So, you know, I just, I, I think people like that has been really cool. No. And it's important to see how and what other people are doing because it's a matter of taking what resonates with you to be able to make it your own and, and improve it. And people really enjoy this style of show too. I mean, Julia, people have made a couple of shows on Julia Child in the last couple of years and like they've all been very popular. If you haven't seen the movie, you know, the, the movie about Julia Child or a new show, it's pretty neat, but it shows you how she overcame a lot of different obstacles and was really the first cooking show and one of the first women on TV, so. In talking about cooking, do you consider yourself a chef or are we going to see a cookbook or anything like that? That's always been my goal. So in that year of home ec, I actually did a cookbook in like seventh and eighth grade and my parents still have it with my Polaroid pictures of the food. And that's always been a long-term goal. Um, but I had to establish myself a little bit and I had to build up credibility in this space. And I think we've gotten to a point where I would like to start to work on one. And I think I might bring in friends from TV um, that I've met and maybe if they have a family recipe that they really love, they get to come teach me their family recipe, different celebrities that I've met and um, put that into a book. Sounds like a TV show. I mean, that would be awesome. <laughs> to have a cooking show Jerry? and not have to fight my friends on TV anymore <laughs> would be really fun. But, um, you know, we started to make sleep pillows and so now we're going into hotels in Charleston where you stay at a couple of hotels um, in town, like you'll notice that you're sleeping on our pillows because a lot of people like the inserts that we made for our throw pillows so much that we make in South Carolina that we're like, maybe we should turn this into sleeping pillows. Now we're going into a hotel in New York and I'm like, is that the direction of this business? Are we going to start doing, you know, more standard products like that or more loud things like, you know, we do have something coming up with a big grocery company basically that we're going to have a lot of items in their store where where you used to see Martha Stewart's face on products like towels and linens, you're going to start to see my face there and you're going to start to see sewing down south. And so that's another direction that we're going in. And so I think the sustainable growth has been the goal. I want to do everything now. You know, I always, every day I wish we were making another product, but fortunately with Amanda, her rule with me is I can't do another product until I make one successful. And that kind of slows me down, which is, which has been, you know, it's been good. To we'll call it controlled growth. Yes, controlled growth. <laughs> All right. And, um, you know, ev everybody knows you initially from the show. Right. Um, I want to go into where Southern Charm started. Yeah, what's neat is in my, uh, in the book that I wrote, which was a bizarre experience, but it was really neat. It was like a year-long therapy session because I just decided to be, you know, completely honest in it. I mean, there's no point in being on TV or writing these books if, there's no way to help people if you can't show that you struggled too. So NBC actually let me for the first time write about the casting process in the book. They had always removed it from anyone else's book that was on the network because NBC is Bravo's parent company. So Whitney that's on the show with me had sold this idea to Bravo in California, but they didn't like the people that he had on the show. So they sent character scouts to Charleston and they reached out to me and said that they were doing a documentary in Charleston and they needed someone to show the guys around. So for a month, I just took this crew out to dinner and took them out to the bars and they were paying for everything. And I was 23 at the time. <laughs> and then about after a month uh, of showing them around, they told me that they had, had secretly been scouting me the whole time and that they wanted to put me on camera. So, you know, I was in law school at the time and I asked my dean what to do, and she was like, well, what will you regret more? Like, not doing it and wondering what if, or doing it and, and you know, have to dealing with some of the consequences later. And, I mean, a couple years later, I was in front of the South Carolina Supreme Court, all five justices, trying to explain to them why <laughs> just because something's called reality TV doesn't mean that every single thing on the show was accurate. Um, so that was the challenge that came through it. But, I, I mean, it was... It was unexpected. Uh, I didn't know anyone that was casted with me at the time, but it was about a year before cameras showed up. So in that time, me, Cameron, and Shep got to know each other, and we were like, I guess, you know, Charleston didn't have a Hollywood presence or a production presence, so it was all brand new to the town. You know, Charleston was scared it was going to be like Jersey Shore because that was kind of the leading show at the time. So a lot of restaurants wouldn't let us film there. 
Um, and then two years later, our friends that own the restaurants are like, hey, can you come film at our <laughs> restaurant? And you're like, yeah, yeah. So, no, it's amazing. And now we have a new season coming out. Yeah, the new season comes out in a couple weeks. I think it's going to be... We got back to our roots a little bit. Um, you know, Charleston's a crazy enough place that I was like, we don't need your ideas. We don't need you to come and force us to go to lunch with ex-girlfriends anymore. I was like, just film us and you will have a great show. And, and this year they capture something on camera where Shep and I had zero clue and they have multiple cameras on us and a big scandal comes out and they have our real reactions. You know, I, I have to get up and like walk away from the table because I'm kind of laughing at how absurd it is. And then throughout the season, you get to see our real lives address everything going on. And so I think it's gonna be, I think it'll be a more fun season this year. Any leaks? Yeah, I probably already <laughs> said too right. much, but um, it's gonna be, you know, Paige films the whole season with me, which is great. You know, she's, when, when I'm filming in Charleston, she's down there. And like this summer I spent in New York because she was filming. And I think, you know, I spent a lot of time working on myself over the last two years, which, you know, even though I got mad at other shows that we had been on, on maybe like the editing or stuff, it makes you really focus on yourself and be like, look, your message a lot, like my friend Sierra told me, she was like, your message a lot of the times is correct, Craig, but it always gets lost in your delivery. And so I said, well, how do I work on that? And I was like, well, maybe if I stop, you know, maybe if I stop drinking so much and maybe if I got healthy, I wouldn't explode on people. And so this is the first season in a while that I'm not stressed about it coming out because the only person I yell at is Shep and I think everyone can understand that. Um, and I really deal with my issues a little better. And so what you'll see this season is me working on myself, me working on, you know, becoming a part, a better partner for my girlfriend and it's exciting. Um, you know, there's been other seasons where I was, you know, I left the country when the show came on because <laughs> I couldn't deal to face, you know, what had happened on it. But this year we get to sit off to the side and really just gossip about everyone else. So no, that's all. do you look forward? Will you actually watch every this season, single episode? This, well, I say I will now. <laughs> we'll see how stressed out I get. But yeah, I'm excited for it. I think it'll be fun. I think you get to see a lot more of the company and uh, a little more deeper look into our lives. All right, and with that, I, I want to kind of open it up to you guys. Does anyone have a question? Yeah, we love That I can come down questions. and... Uh, I saw a lot of hands earlier. Here you go. Hi, Craig. Hey. So nice to meet you. You too. Um, I'm very proud of you, by the way. I just, Thank you. Really, you've done a great job. I want to know, what does Naomi think of your sewing now? <laughs> you know, I do have to give her credit. Um, after her breakup, you know, in New York, she did send me a message that basically said everything that everyone would want to hear. So it was like, you know, you were right and I'm sorry and, you know, congratulations on everything. And, you know, I told her what I tell a lot of people that come to the store is that, you know, it all happens for a reason. Like it sucked at the time, but through that strife, you know, it really gave me you know, a kick in the butt to, to get to where I was. But, um, you know, she was, she was very nice about it. So, but yeah, so that happened. Any other questions over here? I know that there's questions. <laughs> you can ask. No, you want to ask questions? Hi, Craig. Hey. I'm an adamant fan. I watch your show regularly. Thank and you along with Paige's show. Do you actually think she'll ever move to North Carolina? Well, what's funny is she's probably within earshot at this point, us speakers. Um, I think you'll get to see on both Southern Charm and then the new season of Summer House is, is us figuring out how to not let those future decisions kind of ruin the, the moment that we're living in. Um, there's a level of it's not delusion because I know one day we'll have to face that, but we really, what we do now works. And until we have kids, I don't think that we have to face that. I mean, of course, my hope is that she comes down and she was able to design a lot of the new house and make it feel like home. But I think we've just accepted that we don't know what's gonna happen, but we can either go date someone that we don't like as much and have that traditional kind of path or stick it out with this crazy situation that we're in and see what happens. And I think we've really moved into a team spot. Like, 
the other day when all the summer house stuff broke, we were walking out the door with our suitcases to fly down to Jupiter to visit our friends. And I was in the hallway of our apartment in New York with our suitcases and she's like, Craig, I can't go anymore. I have to film tomorrow. And I like threw a fit. I was like, I was, had suitcases in my hands. I was like, your filming was supposed to be over. We're going to Florida. And she's like, well, Craig, I have to film. And what, we, what, what was really awesome in that is that we realized that we're not arguing against each other anymore, but that we're actually on a team. And even though we were frustrated with the situation, that's who we were like kind of mad at. We weren't mad at each other. We were frustrated with the situation. So I think we're, we're really learning how to be a team and, 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 and see each other as a partner instead of, you know, the adversary. So it's been nice. But yes, I, I think probably one day. <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll always have a place up there, but. Hey, Craig. Hi. Um, so yeah, Paige was right. Just throwing that out there, if she can hear me. You were <laughs> totally right. <laughs> um, also, uh, any plans on any other uh, Sewing Down South locations? Yes, actually we do. Um, we will be opening a store, our second store in Nashville uh, next year, so next spring. So we would love to come to South Florida. We do love it down here, and you guys fit into everything that we do. But Nashville has a very similar foot traffic as Charleston. And Nashville is just so big that it would be hard not to test a second location there. And what we've done is, I used to think it was a little cheap, but it's not. But we've started to do merchandise where, like, we make stuff that says Charleston now. And so now you can buy something from Sewing Down South, but also get a Charleston souvenir. And I don't, I don't mean, like... Not cheap, but I thought it would be too easy. I don't know. I just didn't know if that was the right direction, but it really works. And so now I think in Nashville, if we sell stuff that says Nashville, Nashville attire, Nashville merchandise, it'll do really well. So that's the second location that we're going to test. Hey, Craig. Hey, what's up, man? So uh, my parents are moving to uh, South Carolina. Uh, other than Charleston, what's your uh, favorite places to live? South Carolina. Um, I really like Greenville a lot, like out where Clemson is located. Greenville's a great city. It's up and coming. Um, Columbia's great. You know, the big cities. I mean, Pauly's Island is awesome. Um, did you mean South Carolina or anywhere else? Yeah, South Carolina. You know, it's funny because a lot of people think one, you know, South Carolina can fall into a stereotypical like southern state kind of persona but Charleston is a kind of a transplant city so there's a lot of people from the northeast there there's a lot of people from Florida and I think some of the other towns like Greenville are like that I like to travel into the country a little and like if Shep takes me to one of his farmhouses to like go bird hunting which I don't know what I'm doing like it's fun to see that stuff and to meet everyone but I really like the more metropolitan areas of South Carolina which really still don't feel like a city. It still feels like a big beach town, but I'd say like Greenville, Pauly's Island. Um, we make, uh, what is, um, there's a, uh, a town called Beaufort, which we make a lot of our pillows, and Beaufort is beautiful. It's kind of, they have tomato farms, blueberry farms, and we have a factory down there, so I get to go down there a lot, and that is a, that's a hidden gem, Beaufort. We have a question here. Hi, Craig. Hey. In your opinion, what are the top three challenges a new entrepreneur entrepreneur will face? Um, I think getting started, uh, for me, it was always making that sale. Like, I had the demand, but I didn't know how to convert it into an actual transaction, um, like a real business deal. And so when we, we finally got onto Shopify, which they do a good job and it really doesn't cost any money. They take, you know, a small percentage out of your sales and figuring out how to actually ship something to someone, which we use ShipStation for that. And it prints the label for you. And I remember when we packed the first box and sent it, I was like, okay, now we have a business. Um, scale, like scaling has been, has been hard. Cause I was like, well, how do we turn this into a real business where, you know, one day I can use this as my primary income and still coach my kids' teams and make it to recitals and stuff. So I think scaling, um, and I think like believing in yourself, like I said, I mean, I, 
everyone just told me not to do it and that it wasn't a good idea. And it wasn't until I found, I mean, fortunately, I, I, I thought it was a good idea, but bringing in two partners is what saved me because they had the expertise to be like, hey, there's a way to test this business out and not put any money into it. And that's where Jerry was like, there's a way to sell a product by having someone else make it for you and do like a net 60 payment program with them. And, you know, we only sold like nine pillows a day for that first month and second month. So we weren't losing money, but we weren't making a lot. But we were able to figure out how to test the business. So for me, that was the beginning challenges. And um, I just wanted to come back up and we'll wrap this up soon. But talking about also other things that you're getting into and really evolving, because from every aspect of your life, it's like a constant evolution. And even your podcast, Pillows and Beer, where you started and where you're going and where you are now, you know, it's inspiring. And and where do you see that going? Well, and it's such a I'll just tell you the truth, but it's it's not a like sexy answer, but. I just started to wake up and do physical activity in the morning and it changed my whole life. I mean, it, it was, I was able to cut my drinking by 90%. All of a sudden my energy was through the roof, which is kind of driving him crazy because every day I have like a new idea now. And it was really just working on my physical health of even just going outside and walking around if I didn't feel like it has changed a lot. And then, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just, it, well, I was talking about... Oh, because all, Pillows and Beer, pillows so and Pillows beer. and yeah. Beer started as, it was a drinking podcast, and we would just, you know, we would get buzzed with each other and talk about nonsense, but there was no sustainability in that, because I, I didn't, re- like, I, I really wanted to become a better, like, adult, and so we just signed with this podcast company, and we do two shows, two daily shows a week now, and it's not a drinking podcast anymore, and, like, turning... You know, filming reality TV, the truth of the matter is most of what we do is based around drinking. Like when I go to work, you drink like that's just like you don't you might not see it on TV, but that is pretty much every show out there. And so breaking that habitual behavior of being like, oh, I have to go film a scene today. That doesn't mean I have to get drunk or like I'm going to do a meet and greet. That doesn't mean I have to drink like I'm going to film a podcast. I don't have to drink. And so it's not a struggle that everyone deals with, but breaking those habits and like kind of growing up a little more, which I'm 35. So you're like, of course you should be grown up. But you know, tomorrow's the next day of the rest of your life. And I had a lot of regret and used to be mean to myself by being like, you should be so much further along than you are. But when you kind of let that go, it, it really helps. And you know, Paige just turned 30 and it was kind of freaking her out. And I was like, well, I didn't start sewing down south till I was 31. And I think that really helped her, which I was like, you're a baby. I mean, you know, the person that started Uber was 50 years old. Like Vera Wang didn't make her first dress till she was like 56. I mean, stuff like that really helped me be like, there's plenty of time to do this. Just tomorrow, do a little more than you did today. Most success comes after failures. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know, I mean, you have to learn from somewhere, but... Um, I want to obviously thank you for this. I mean, sitting down, go over from the show to business to life. You know, let's all give a round of applause for Craig. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for being me. here. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, it's fun. You know, I, I still get nervous to do this stuff, which is hilarious because it's been like a decade of filming. But it's really fun to see you guys and to, to tell the story and um, to still be a part of this world. Uh, Life after reality TV. I don't know what that looks like, but it, it'll be a funny adventure. I mean, hopefully that's not starting yet. But, but <laughs> no, there's, there's a lot more to see there's a lot in more all to aspects see. of life. Yes. But thank you all for joining. Um, we're going to be right over where the step and repeat is over there if you'd like to take a yeah, picture. Yeah, if you guys want to come take a picture or something, I'll be right over there. So thanks for having me, all.